Hi, everybody. I just want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar. Uh, we are going to be conducting Inside the Mind of the Appraiser. My name is Laura Height. I'm the corporate trainer here at Coaster VMS. Uh, just to give a little bit of background information about myself, I'm actually a licensed real estate appraiser for the state of Virginia and have been for about six years now. So today we're just going to be discussing a few things about the appraisal industry. We're going to be discussing what appraisers look for in a home, how lenders' guidelines affect appraisals, what they're required to report back, how the inspection process takes place, FHA guidelines and tips, um, how to communicate with an appraiser, which we get so many questions about, um, especially with you know the start of the HVCC years ago and Dodd Frank. So we're going to show you what to do, what not to do, and what to never ever do. Um, we're also going to just touch on value and green improvement um, as this becomes more prevalent in the marketplace these days. Um, we're also going to follow up with a Q&A. And again, if we have any questions or anything that is not discussed. Um, over the meeting and you don't feel comfortable um, asking it in this forum, you can always email me. Uh, it's going to be lheight at coastervms.com. Um, at the end of the webinar, I'm going to have all of my contact information as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So what's inside the mind of the appraiser? Uh, well, I think some clients may think that um, you know, it's just, it's not much and it doesn't take a lot to become an appraiser, but that is actually completely not true. It's actually a four-year college degree is required. Um, there's going to be 300 hours of education classes, which is going to be actual classroom hours. These are not credit hours. These are actual hours sitting in a classroom in front of a teacher. Um, 3,000 hours logged field experience. Um, you have to pass the criminal background check and become an apprentice for two years. Uh, then you have to take a 200 question test and score 80% or above. That test usually takes about six to seven hours to, to take and you have to make 80% or above. Um, once you've done that, you will then take an FHA course and then you have to take an FHA exam to pass that. And then you've really become an appraiser that has not that much experience. So, and that's one thing that um, when you are taking, you know, your courses and your classroom hours, you learn how to be an appraiser. But when you actually do, you know, your field experience is when you learn how to actually be an appraiser. So, you learn more of the philosophies about it. It's cool. So, we're going to be discussing a little bit on, you know, communicating with the appraiser, what you can do. You can talk to an appraiser. You can have normal conversations about the property. You can question the work completed as long as you provide information. Um, what you can't do is you cannot try to influence value. Um, you can't select the specific appraiser you want for an assignment. You cannot threaten to withhold uh, future work from them either if they don't hit the value. So these are just kind of common misconceptions um, that have been um, popping up with HVCC and Dodd-Frank. Um, so we're going to talk also about what appraisers really look for in a home. Appraisers look for similar use that would appeal to a broader audience. Um, the specifics aren't as important as location, uh, the market, other unchangeable factors. Anything that can be changed with relative ease is not as much of a factor, um, such as kitchens and baths. You could you know, renovate the nicest, have the nicest renovation, but if you're in an area that doesn't really have much marketability, all the renovations in the world might not bring that much value to it. So the biggest single factor is going to be the neighborhood style of the home and the overall renovation. Um, appraisal guidelines versus lender guidelines. So what we have here is an actual map of the United States, as you can tell. And this is how everyone else sees our country. And this is how appraisers look at our state. But when it comes to guidelines, this is how our guidelines are written. They are written for these specific markets because these are the um, the biggest markets in our country. So when it comes to how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have written the guidelines, it's around the major guidelines, around the major markets. And within that major market, they're writing these guidelines to fit the typical home within the major market. So typical home, 273,000, 2,700 square foot, three bedroom, two bath, heated by gas. So as an appraiser going into a really nice um, 
very marketable area with the cookie cutter homes, the track homes. You know, that's a dream come true because it's usually very easy to, <laughs> to find comparables. But um, being an appraiser, you kind of end up with situations like this. Um, you can get the geodome homes, which they're, I know they're good in, I think, severe weather. But, <laughs> but I know in Richmond, Virginia, we do not have a lot of those. Um, you run into situations like this. Um, and then this is actually an appraisal that was done by um, a staff appraiser here at Coaster. This is actually, I believe, um, he was a professor and spent you know, well over $100,000 putting in this gorgeous library in one of his bedrooms. However, being an appraiser and going into a situation like this, to have this appeal to a broader audience, they're probably going to have to take this out. So it could be a negative adjustment, even though they spent you know, a great deal of money putting all of this woodwork in, when it comes to the broader audience, you know, it can have a negative effect. So these are sort of situations appraisers run in. Um, for instance, this house, if you notice that there's a power line right there, and they have a garage right there, which you would say they have a garage, but, but there's no access to the garage. So now it's just a big storage area. Um, you run into stuff like this, where as you can see, this is a really ugly bathroom as well. But if you notice, there's two um, toilets, if you will. And the homeowner really wanted their bathroom to be called a Jack and Jill bathroom, so they installed an extra toilet, which does not count for a Jack and Jill bathroom. So, you know, you run into all sorts of things dealing, you know, with the public and properties. Um, then you have situations like this with a, an enormous um, awesome view, uh, the living room is great, the, look at the fireplace is awesome, but finding another property that's going to be similar to this one, it's going to be finding a, a needle in a haystack. So, you know, again, it's just things that appraisers have to deal. We don't always have the most, um, the best house, the most um, typical home in the most typical market. A lot of appraisers don't, you know, have that luxury. A lot of the time it's not like that. So. Again, I'm just showing examples of what appraisers have to deal with on a daily basis. So we're going to go to appraisal form. The creation of the appraisal form was to try and standardize the way things are reported back to the lender in an easily understandable format. So just to give a little uh, history about the URAR, which I'm sure most of you uh, deal with, the 1004. Um, it was revised in March of 2005. It grew from two pages to six pages. It incorporated the former addendum, the 1004B, which is going to be the assumptions and limiting conditions. Um, appraiser certifications, 9 to 25. My appraisals, um, when I do them, usually consist of about 30 pages long. So having it go from you know maybe 12 pages to 30 is a great deal. So there's just more work and more research that goes into them these days. Um, which is, of course, necessary. Um, to report on the URAR or the 1004 URAR, um, well, you can only report for one unit property or one unit property with an accessory unit, a uh, unit in a PUD. And these are going to require interior inspection and requires the 1004 MC addendum, which is the market conditions addendum, which is pretty much illustrating to the lender what the market looks like in particular for the subject property. Um, what's required in the report, you're also going to have to have the exterior building sketch with dimensions, interior dimensions for condo or co-op, um, floor plan, um, if it's atypical or functionally obsolete, you need to go in great detail about that, um, GLA calculations or square footage calculations, um, street map, subject with comparables. Um, you'll also have to have photos, subject properties, front, rear, and street. If it's SHA, you need to have the sides as well. Interior uh, photos of certain areas. So that's going to be um, you know, your basic living area. So your kitchens, your living room, bedrooms, bathrooms. If it's an SHA appraisal, uh, usually there is a requirement for a head and shoulders inspection of the attic and of uh, the crawl space. Um, if for instance, the property is a rental property or an income producing property, you're going to have to order the 216, which is the operating income statement. Um, if it's rental, you're going to have to have the a rent schedule as well. And I'm just going over these because I've noticed that um, when some 
some people, some lenders or loan officers are ordering these appraisals and say it is a rental property or say it's a duplex or something like that. Um, and they're not ordering them, and these are actually additional charges. Uh, there are additional forms that the appraiser has to fill out. There's additional research that goes into it as well. So also in the report for the comps, you're going to have the adjustments and the sales grid, uh, the addendums, the reconciliation, and the value. So what we have here is going to be the sales grid. So we're going to have the subject information here, top of rules one, two, and three. And then, of course, any more comparables that will be added, they're going to add additional sheets to that, too. But this is where pretty much is going to be the, the breakdown of the property. So we're going to have all of the information, uh, the view, quality of construction, the room count, the GLA, if there's basement, um, heating and cooling, energy efficient items, garage, everything is going to be right here. And this is just sort of how you're going to break down, you know, the description of each property and then their adjustment. And this is also where match pair analysis comes in, which is how appraisers come up with their adjustments. So as you can see, these are this is the exact same house. This is before renovations and after. So what appraisers look for when making adjustments is they are taking the subject property and then trying to find other comparables that match, you know, to the subject property. So in a dream world, we had our subject property A. We found comparables one and two that were in, you know, the same neighborhood and sold within the previous 90 days. The only difference between the two is there's a $10,000 sales price difference. And when it comes to features, the only thing different is say a wraparound porch. So in a dream world, everything is the same, and we know that that wraparound porch added $10,000 in value to comparable two. Um, comparable one doesn't have a wraparound porch, but the subject has a compar has a wraparound porch. So therefore, we would add ten thousand dollars to comparable one because that's going to be a match pair analysis. So you're just comparing the two and extracting the differences and putting a value with those differences. Now, of course, it doesn't always work that way. So that's when experience plays a big role. Um, as you're appraising, you're learning your market and you're learning. Um, you know, what values go to what amenities, and so that's where the adjustments and the experience comes into play. Um, determining market conditions, um, if you are familiar with the form, you will notice on the front page, or the first page, sorry, um, you're going to have um, the market conditions, this one unit housing trend. So this is going to be the overall general market trend for the area. You'll have stable, oversupply, over six months. Um, but when you go down to the market conditions addendum, the 1004 MC that I talked about earlier, this is where the appraiser is going to take um, all the information for the submarket and sort of come up with whether or not it's stable, increasing. They're taking all the, the total number of comparable sales and breaking them down over the previous 12 months. And the information here helps helps determine what they're going to check here. Granted, this is the overall market trend, and this is going to be the sub-market analysis, but it does help in determining the market and the market conditions, whether it's stable, increasing, declining, and pretty much what's going on with that market. And this helps the lender understand what's going on. So from here, we're going to have street maps with the comp. So subject property is going to be right here in red, and then it's going to have a breakdown of a comparables one through six. Their locations, their distances, and this just again is showing the lender what um, the market looks like. So from here we're going to have subject photos. We're going to have the subject front, the street, the rear. Um, we'll have comparable photos. Um, we're going to have a home sketch. Now this is going to be an example of a home sketch uh, for single family residential, and then this is going to be a condo sketch. Now, I'm sure none of you out here have ever run into issues where the square footage is off. Now, when it comes to measuring, uh, getting the square footage or the GLA for a property, which as I can see, we're getting a question for that right now, and I'll answer that in just one second. Um, 
it's going to be sometimes hard to get an exact measurement. If the, if the measurement, if the square footage is off by, I don't know, 500 square feet and it's different from the tax record, that's when the appraiser should take it upon themselves to go back out there and re-measure the property just to make sure that they're correct. Sometimes tax records are not correct. Um, and if, you know, the square footage is off by, you know, 100 square feet, that's really not that big of an issue. It's going to average out within the comp analysis anyways. But if it's anything over, you know, three or 500, then that, that's going to be a red flag. But the reason it's not going to be 100% accurate is because it's designed just to be a reflection of the general layout of the property. It's sort of just giving the um, lender an idea of the property and how it looks. And the reason that is is because houses have bushes. They have things, trees around them. They have landscaping. There's things, you know, that can be in the way, um, especially when it comes to um, condo properties or condominiums. Most of the time, let me go back to that screen here. So when it comes to condos, you know, this side and this side, maybe, you know, all three sides are going to be covered with, you know, another unit or other units. So you have to measure from the inside. And then you need to take your measurements that you got, maybe go to the builder, um, see if you can get a sketch. That's what, that's what I always do. Um, I'm sure, I think a lot of appraisers do that as well, just to double check their work. So again, it's not designed to be 100% accurate. It, it's designed to give a general reflection of the layout. Um, so if it's in with, you know, 100 square feet or so, that's really nothing to worry about. Um, granted, if it's a 500 square foot house and it's off by 100 square feet, then that's a big red flag. But, um, you know, you're going to have to take it in consideration of uh, the size of the property, the location, things like that. And then right here, if you can notice, this is all, this is a two-story home. The first level is connected, but the second level isn't. So finding the GLA for this property would be a nightmare, and again, appraisers deal with this all the time. So, and through experience and doing it, you learn how to how to measure the property. But again, if it's off by just a little bit, that's normal. So, what's the purpose of the form? It's to gather all the information needed for the lender in an organized format. This is actually not the appraisal. The appraisal is the value and certification by the appraiser. Anything else is a lender requirement. So that actual, the number, the appraiser's certification is actually the appraiser appraisal. The, all the forms, what we're required to report in the form, those are going to be lender requirements, and they are in no way um, a use tap requirement. We are required to, um, you know, represent the property in, you know, in, you know, give a proper representation of the property, but filling out a specific form is not a use tap requirement. That is a lender requirement. Um, when it comes to Fannie Mae guidelines, which is, you know, Fannie Mae is the, the biggest one when it comes to lender requirements and guidelines. Um, provide sales contract to the appraiser. The lender must provide the appraiser with all financing data and sales possession, concessions for the subject. Uh, lender must provide appraiser with a sales contract and all addenda. If the sales contract is amended, the amendments must be provided to the appraiser. And I'm seeing that we're getting a question about this, which doesn't surprise me. I um, go across the country and talk about, um, you know, inside the mind of the appraiser and trying to just sort of bridge that gap between appraisers, realtors, and um, the lending community, and I find that I have a lot of questions when it comes to the sales contract and why uh, the appraiser needs the sales contract. If it's a purchase contract, what we're trying to do is we're determining market value for lending purposes. So the best comparable for this subject is going to be the subject because it has been on the open market and it sat there and then the market determined I am willing to, or the market's willing to pay this price for this house on this date. So again, that's why the sales concessions and all the financing, everything, the sales contracts provided to the appraiser because they're going to put that information also in the sales grid that I showed you earlier. So again, you know, we're trying to determine market value. So the best way to determine market value is when the market has actually determined the value of the property. So you get that question quite often. Um, selection of comparable sales. 
appraisers to provide an explanation as to why specific comparables were used in the appraisal report. That's going to be a use app requirement. That's what the appraisers, um, that's sort of like our Bible. It's what we follow um, for our profession. Um, now the next part is four comparables total, meaning out of the amount of comparables that the appraiser is using, Fannie Mae has requirements for four of them. So say the appraiser has found six comparables. Well, Fannie Mae wants me to use two comparables that are within 90 days, and two of the other comparables have to be either listings or contracts. And that's just going to be showing the lender. Um, this is going to give the lender another example of how the, the market is moving. Um, and the two comparables within 90 days, you know, cannot, it's not always possible. And then the appraiser has to go you know, further back in time. Um, and I always tell people appraisers go further back in time before they go further out in distance. So, you know, you can use a sale that was, you know, six months old, but you have to, the appraiser has to make sure that they explain exactly why they did that. And again, that's a Fannie Mae guideline, not a USAP guideline. Um, other Fannie Mae guidelines are going to be urban, one mile, for going out in distance to find comparables. Uh, suburban, two miles, and rule is going to be 10 miles. Now, again, these are not USAP guidelines. These are Fannie Mae guidelines. So from here, we're going to go to repair escrow, existing construction. Appraisers reporting the existence of minor conditions or deferred maintenance items not affecting Livability, soundness, or structural integrity of the property may complete the appraisal with an as-is status. Minor conditions, deferred maintenance items to be remedied or completed after closing may be escrowed by the lender. Property must be appraised subject to completion of specific alterations or repairs when there are incomplete items or conditions affecting livability, soundness, or structural integrity. So uh, most of you who are, are attending today are in the lending industry, so I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, when appraising the entire site of a property, um, the appraiser must include the actual size of the site, not a hypothetical portion of the site. Uh, I have a good story about this. When I was first appraising, of course, I was working under a certified appraiser, and I had a client who I was allowed to do appraisals for. And I, one of my first appraisals was out in the rural, um, it was in a rural county, it was on I think 15 or 20 acres, but the lender only would lend on nothing over five acres. So they wanted me just to appraise the property on five acres. So they wanted me to appraise a hypothetical portion of the site, which I did, and sent it to my um, the appraiser I was working under, which I got in a lot of trouble for. But um, you know, that's one of those things. If if it's for lending purposes, the appraiser cannot portion out the site. We can portion out the site if it's actually already been portioned out through the county and tax records and everything. Um, if they're actually separate, then we can do that, of course. But we cannot separate or portion out a hypothetical part of it. So you know that's just something to remember, especially when you're placing these appraisal orders. You have to um, just remember that the appraiser is going to appraise the entire site. So neighborhood boundaries. Preferable for the appraiser to provide comparables from the subject's neighborhood. Fannie Mae does allow for the use of comparable sales that are located in competing neighborhoods. So this is, again, what we were talking about earlier when it comes to the neighborhood boundaries, having the urban one mile, suburban two, and rural ten. Um, so the appraiser can go outside of that, that, that area. They just have to make sure they explain what they're doing. So best comparables available and most appropriate for the appraiser's analysis. The appraiser must indicate the comparables are from a competing neighborhood and address any differences that exist. Now, understanding FHA and what appraiser or appraisers are looking for. Now, when I was um, appraising or when I was being taught um, under a certified appraiser when it comes to FHA, he always said <laughs> that when it comes to FHA, you need to pretend there's like five five-year-olds running around the house and won't get hurt. So that's the best way I can put it. And again, at the end of this, we're going to print this up to PDF, and I will be sending out an FHA checklist that we've come up that we've come up with. This is just going to be helpful for you, your clients, your realtor clients, um, you know, the borrowers, 
you know, before they have an appraiser come out and it's an FHA appraisal, they can sort of make sure these things are already done and taken care of. That way the appraiser doesn't have to come back to the property um, for a final inspection because that's also an additional charge. So these are just things we're trying to, here at COSA, we're trying to help you with. So what FHA will lend on is going to be detached one to four units, uh, semi-detached one to four units, townhouses, row houses, condominiums, uh, approved projects, spot unit approvals. And eligible properties, commercial enterprises, boarding houses, motels, hotels, tourist houses, private clubs, uh, bed and breakfast, fraternity. So it's going to be pretty much um, you know, single family residential for the most part. Um, so none of these, nothing that's going to be too commercial. So eligible properties, you have brownstone, a condo, single family, an eligible funeral home, bed and breakfast, shopping center. Um, FHA will finance properties with minimal non-residential use. Um, what one of the conditions is if they take the total square footage of the property, the actual rental property or the income producing property has to be less than or 25 percent or less than the total square footage. So that it also needs to be self-sufficient. The net rental income needs to be more than the monthly payment. Um, the net rental income also is going to have to include vacancies, so it's going to be the appraiser's estimate for vacancies or the actual vacancy. Um, when it comes to lending, I believe it's 75%. So what, what that is, what that's meaning is we're saying that it's going to take 25% of a year to have once um, a tenant has left to rehab the property and put it back on the market um, to have it um, filled again. So. Um, un other unacceptable locations can be hazards, environmental contaminants, noxious odors, defensive sites, excessive noises, uh, to the point of endangering the physical improvements. This would not pass for FHA, as you can tell. Um, when it comes to private water and sewer systems, the appraiser is to report if public water and sewer are available. Lender is to determine feasibility. Usually connection is considered feasible if the cost is less than 3% of the appraised value. If the home's been vacant for 30 days or several months, inspections, additional inspections, and dye tests will be required. Again, this isn't something, um, you know, with all the REOs that are out there, we're just trying to sort of give you a heads up um, that it wouldn't be, it's not going to be weird if an appraiser orders, you know, extra inspections, especially when it comes to the mechanical system. Um, when it comes to site analysis, is the appraiser required to report well and septic and property line distances? No. The appraiser is not required to sketch the distances, however, should be aware of the distances and if discernible and comment on them. Requesting a copy of a survey, a survey is recommended. And this is actually from FHA. So this is something that we find a lot, um, a lot of lenders, uh, it used to be a requirement that the appraiser had to state you know, where the well and septic were, the property line, and all that, all that stuff. But now it's not a requirement for FHA. Uh, private roads, private streets and shared driveways. Each property must have vehicular or pedestrian access. Road surface over which emergency vehicles can pass. Absence of these items must be noted. So I'm sure you've seen in reports where it says all weather vehicle access. That just means that um, that emergency vehicles can pass. From here, we're going to go to accessory units. This has to deal with, if you look at the picture, you'll have a mother-in-law suite above a garage, or maybe you have a mother-in-law suite in addition to the house. So FHA will lend on these. Um, have a living unit added to create within or detached from a single family dwelling. Accessory units may not be subdivided or segregated, so they're going to have to be included in there. Um, when it comes to utility, utilities, um, if the utilities are turned off, the appraiser must return at a later date. Electrical, plumbing, and or heating certifications may be called for by the appraiser, and he or she cannot determine if one or all of these systems are working properly. So in other words, when you have an, an FHA appraisal and you know the appraiser is going out there, make sure all, all, all utilities are turned on, because if they are off, the appraiser is going to have to come back out there and determine that they're on, which is, again, going to be an additional charge. So 
All habitable rooms must have a heat source. This does not mean that each room must contain a heating device, that each room must receive sufficient heat. Um, so again, this just means that there doesn't have to be a vent in every room, but it needs to be um, adequately heated and cooled. The appraiser is not to test air conditioning systems if the outside temperature is below 50 degrees, as it may harm the system. The appraiser must note in the appraisal that he or she could not adequately observe the entire roof area and then state which areas were unobservable. Based on the information reported by the appraiser, the underwriter will determine whether or not roof inspection is required. Um, it's no longer required to order roof inspection for all flat roofs. So that's, again, something that's changed. We just want to make you aware. Other unacceptable locations are going to be um, below a 100-year flood level and flood insurance is not available. Unacceptable area near an airport. And we're going to go into more detail about that in a minute. Um, Areas that are unstable, not approved project, or not approved easements, again, these are not going to be acceptable, acceptable locations. Um, when it comes to the airport, um, there's going to be three noise zones, the clear zone, and then the accidental potential zone. So what this is meaning, uh, usually most properties that were within these areas have been purchased by the airport. Um, you know, I am from Richmond, Virginia. There is a airport. It's the Richmond International Airport, and there is a, a there is a ton of neighborhoods right by there. And if the market determines that there is a market for these neighborhoods, then FHA will lend on them. Um, but again, when it comes to the accidental potential zone and the tree noise zones, um, FHA will red flag it. Appraisers who work in the CBRS areas must obtain appropriate maps from the U.S. Wildlife and Wildlife Services, so the Barrier Resource System. Um, prohibited areas are going to be the map on the maps that are in red right here. So FHA will not run to these areas. Now, the best way to deal with the appraiser. So this is going to be um, what we talked about earlier about how to communicate with the appraiser, what to do, what not to do. Um, and this was actually on our Facebook. It says being nice. Um, the appraiser always helps, which is fun. Um, what to do if your value comes in low? Submit an appraisal rebuttal. Now, the way you get there's a process, of course, to go through this. Um, you need to provide um, supplemental supplemental comparables that are similar to the subject that would meet lender requirements for standard appraisal practice. Generally speaking, pointing out minor errors will not get the value changed. So we're going to give you a little little tips on how to deal with this. So. Um, address legitimate concerns with the appraisal in which there's tangible evidence the appraisal is flawed and the property is being misrepresented. And that is from our CEO, Brian Coaster. Um, concerns on the appraisal. Uh, it could be better comparable sales are available that support a different value that are not in the report. Misrepresentation of the property. I didn't know the homeowner owned the waterfront lot next to the house. So that could be a view um, adjustment there that wasn't noted, overlooking key features such as acreage view update features, lack of appraiser competency appearing in the report, over conservative appraisal, and lack of attention to detail and multiple errors. Um, what not to do. This appraisal is horrible. We need an extra 10000 to make this work. Call the appraiser, tell them to change it or never use them again. The appraiser missed a ton of stuff, borrowed paid 90000 more two years ago and knows it's worth at least that we need to order a new appraisal, need more value to close to just all of these get us nowhere, especially that second one. Um, you know, the way everything is, you know, worked out with the housing market, a house that sold, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, you know, more two years ago could be, you know, worth a lot less. So it's kind of a normal thing that appraisers run into all the time. So that's probably not the appraiser, but uh, what to do? Notice that the garage adjustment was only 2000 The deal's very tight. Uh, can you see if the appraiser can relook at the garage adjustment? So this could be an, in an instance where the appraiser gave a higher adjustment for, you know, another garage in the report and just, you know, overlooked the garage for the subject or just gave it a minimum adjustment. These are things we can approach the appraiser with. We can ask questions about the report. That's completely compliant. 
Barter indicated the appraiser didn't give appropriate adjustments for upgraded kitchen and, and bathrooms. As you can see from the photos, it's in great shape. Can you have them look again? So maybe there's a difference in opinion when it comes to um, condition of the property. Uh, local realtor was able to find three additional closed sales that support a $20,000 higher value. Can you send these to the appraiser and have them take a look? All of these we can actually send to the appraiser and we can talk to the appraiser. We can ask questions um, about the report to the appraiser. So these are just instances of what we can do. Uh, this is something I always recommend. Um, I'm calling it the uh, appraisal inspection package. So it's, a lot of these have to deal with it if it's a purchase. But copy of a fully executed contract, list of all renovations and improvements done within five years of the property. Uh, for the property, any notable features that are not obvious during the inspection, maybe the gutters were changed, the, the new hot water heater, the HVAC was replaced last year, things like that. Um, the appraiser isn't going to obviously notice. So um, a copy of a sketch if you have one, a plat map. If you have a copy of an old appraisal for the property, the, you can give that to the appraiser. That's fine. Personally, I like that. I, it was just it was kind of an, an additional aid I had to um, check my GLA or my square footage. Um, if purchased, supply the appraiser with comparables the agent used for listing the property. I mean, the appraiser doesn't have to use them, but you know, it's 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 not it's not illegal to give them what the agent used to list the property. So that's absolutely fine. Anything that may be helpful for them to spend more time on the report and less in research is going to be helpful for the appraiser. So what appraisers are dealing with in the mortgage industry, just like everyone is dealing with in the mortgage industry over the past few years, um, there's been so much change to, you know, with the economy, the industry, um, appraiser, a lot of appraisers left, especially going through all of Everything that the appraisers have gone through for them to still be appraisers is them sticking it out, which means they're probably worth their salt. So, you know, just understand we're all in this together. Um, you know, every year it seems like for both the mortgage industry and the appraisal industry, there is things that are being changed, added, more regulations, more red tape. So, um, again, this is just that's where Coaster comes in. We're just trying to sort of bridge that gap and make sure. Everyone knows we're in this together and we'll keep everyone on the same page. Um, I did have a question earlier um, that I'm going to get to at the end concerning square footage. So I just wanted to let you know I didn't ignore you with that one. Um, how are appraisers are looking at green properties? Um, uh, they're very difficult to value. There's no clear structure in place. The best is the AI or Appraisal Institute Ready, Ready Energy Efficient Appraisal Form. That adds some data points. Uh, biggest issue is the lack of data on comps, about two to three years from a real solution. So what this is saying is, um, you know, for, say, the particular area I'm from, Richmond, um, my friend just built a, a house that, you know, a lot of money on having the geothermal installed. And, you know, his house really didn't go, <laughs> go up in value any higher just because there isn't any comparables out there that, have the geothermal that sold for $30,000 more. Um, I know I was speaking in Charlottesville a few weeks ago, and it seems that they do have a market for green buildings, um, and those houses are selling for more. So that area has data, but the, my, the area in Richmond doesn't have a lot of data. There, so the appraiser can't pull out a value out of his hat. He has to have substantial evidence that there is value to the green property. So again, this. Um, Appraisal Institute Ready Energy Efficient form is is very helpful. So, and that's going to be it for today's webinar. But I do want to address the um, issue with the square footage from question from before. Um, it was concerning a laundry room that um, was an addition, but it's not heated or cooled. Um, when it comes to square footage, the if it's an addition, it has to be adequately heated or cooled for it to be included in the square footage. If it's not, um, then it's almost like a storage room, and it's not going to count for the square footage or the GLA. And I think I pretty much hit on every other question I had. Again, um, my contact information is here. My name is Laura Height. I am the uh, market trainer here for Coaster. 
And if you have any more questions, if you didn't um, feel comfortable asking them, you can email them directly to me, and I will address them just as soon as I get them. And thank you, everyone, so much for coming. I hope you have a great day.